Welcome to the Where Humanity Meets Technology podcast, where we talk to business leaders about cybersecurity, data management, and advanced digital solutions to provide strategies to increase the profitability of your company. Now, here's your host, Maurice Hamilton, the CEO of Infinivate Consultancy Services. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Maurice Hamilton, and welcome to our podcast where we name it Where Humanity Meets Technology. This is a podcast show where I interview founders, CEOs, CIOs, uh, different business leaders. In this case, we're, today we're going to actually interview a, a, a former professor of a university. And we talk about uh, how different aspects of technology, uh, business acumen, uh, it could be a, a conversation on digital transformation and how that actually impacts humanity. Uh, so this show is actually a, a show where we actually have those conversations. We actually uh, want your responses and your feedback at the end of the show. And uh, I'm really happy to have everyone here. Uh, so today we actually have Jeff Burns. Jeff Burns actually has a really great correlation when it comes to the topic of leadership. And we're going to have some really, really good conversations about leadership today and how you may be able to take some of his ideas and, and what he learned from Walt Disney. That's right. I said Walt Disney and actually apply it to your organization. So, uh, Jeff, we're really happy to have you here. Welcome to the podcast. Well, thank you, Maurice. Um, honored to be with you and honored to be with your audience today. Thank you. Awesome. That's, re that's really great. Uh, so I actually want to begin the conversation and, and, and just talk a little bit about how did you actually begin the uh, the journey of actually going back and looking at the, the vision that Walt Disney had and, and how did you actually go back and say, you know what, I want to teach this. I want to tell everyone about this. Can you give us a little insight as to how it all began for you? Well, that's a that's a great question. Sort of an origin story, if you will. I uh, I grew up in the Panhandle of Florida. My first trip to a Disney park, and I think our uh, listeners, if they've been to a Disney park, they remember their first visit. Uh, mine was August of 1974. I was 10 years old. Uh, Magic Kingdom in Walt Disney World, and I absolutely loved it. The challenge was. I didn't get to Disneyland, uh, which uh, I'm sort of more known as Dr. Disneyland today because I teach a college course on the history of Disneyland. I didn't actually get to Disneyland um, until 1988, some 14 years later. And by that point, I was an adult. I was in graduate school and I hated it, Maurice. I, I was incredibly disappointed. Uh, the park was it was too small. It was too crowded. It was too hot. And if you had told me then that I'd be doing what I'm doing now some 35 years later, I would have said, you're absolutely nuts. Fortunately, I stayed in California long enough to realize, wow, this place really matters to the locals um, and matters uh, to people in California in a way that at the time, Walt Disney World didn't necessarily matter to Floridians. And, um, you know, Walt was once asked, what does it take to be successful? And he said it comes down to four C's, uh, courage, consistency, curiosity, and confidence. And um, I've been blessed with insatiable curiosity. And so because I hated Disneyland and everyone else around me loved it, I got curious, well, what did I miss? Why does everyone else love it and Jeff hate it? And that's when I discovered Walt Disney, like all of us, was not born successful, difficult relationship with his father, um, bankrupt at age 21 with his first studio, and actually had more failures than successes. And so I, I, I fell in love with that story. And by falling in love with that story, fell in love with the story behind Disneyland. And on my second visit, had a completely different and transformational experience. And um, I've been trying to to teach and and lead based on Walt and, and his park ever since. Wow, that's a fantastic story. It's amazing how you went to the, um, the park the first time and it wasn't a wonderful or cheerful experience that you could write to everyone about. And, and uh, where many years later you went back and it was a completely different experience. Yeah. Well, my, my first attraction was the newest and latest, greatest attraction, which was Star Tours. Mm -hmm. And it took us more than three hours to get on that ride. And 
if if we had experienced it in say five minutes, ten minutes, less than thirty minutes, I probably would have been perfectly fine. And as a result, would have enjoyed my day and probably would have just gotten on with the rest of my life. Um, but interestingly enough, Walt Disney most wanted to be remembered for all of his successes, uh, whether it was Mickey Mouse, whether it was Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs, whether it was Disneyland. Walt most wanted to be remembered as a storyteller. And every great story, Maurice, requires conflict. Well, it was the conflict of waiting in line for three hours it was the conflict of not enjoying my first day at disneyland that gave me my love and joy and passion and quite frankly my career today well i i you know it's funny that you bought that one particular aspect of i remember reading in your book by the way everyone the the book is called the wisdom of walt uh that uh and jeff has written so just to let you everybody know uh, it's a really, really good book. I remember you told talked about that experience there and you were going to Tomorrowland and, and then someone actually let you know, oh, by the way, the lines at the back at the beginning of the park, you said, I wish I had known yeah. that, you know, so you had to go back <laughs> and stand at three of this. So I, I, it, it, but, it, but Walt talked about that. And, and I think I want to touch a little bit about uh, some of the, you mentioned, he, he talk, spoke about his uh, successes and failures. And you mentioned a little bit about things that didn't work. And one of the elements that he was was mentioning that when it, before it became it was Mickey Mouse, uh, it was actually uh, the the rabbit. Was it more to more the rabbit? Um, Oswald. Oswald the rabbit. And it was yeah, Oswald. Oswald the lucky rabbit, mm -hmm. and he lost him after five years of success, mm -hmm. and it was the loss and facing a second bankruptcy that forced him to come up with Mickey Mouse. But originally, Mickey's name was going to be Mortimer. So, so you're not wrong about thinking that there's a Mortimer name out there in the Disney annals. Mm -hmm. And um, it was his wife, Lily, who said, oh, no, Walt, that, that name is awful. Why don't you go with Mickey instead? Wow. It's amazing. Even even with the design of how they uh, they wanted to have Mickey look, you know, with the legs, the 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 jacket and uh, the ears. And it was just amazing to read about how he had that vision said, this is the vision I see for 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 Mickey Mouse. You know, that was amazing. Yeah. And it was all born out of conflict. It was all born out of difficulty. It was all born out of desperation. And I think each of us, if we look back on our lives, we've been through our own conflict. We've been through our own series of difficulties. Maybe right now you're facing um, some sort of um, sense of desperation and, you know, recognize uh, you have a choice in terms of how you approach it. You can panic or pivot. You can implode or innovate. You can retreat or be resourceful. And Walt consistently in moving forward chose to pivot, chose to innovate, chose to be resourceful. Mm -hmm. And in doing so, he didn't just change his world, Maurice. He changed our world. And I think our world is better as a result of the choices he made. I, I agree. And I like how you mentioned that he he went back and looked at the situations and actually saying, what can I do to make this better? How can I make this uh, a uh, more of an experience for? Because he always seems like he always had the experience of the customer in mind. Uh, whatever, whenever, whatever he did, he always seems to have the customer, the end result in mind. Yeah. yeah um, I mean, you know, Mickey Mouse, uh, you know, people were doing cartoons and animated uh, shorts in, you know, the mid to late 1920s. But Mickey came out right as sound was being developed. And um, as much as we sort of herald Steamboat Willie as being the first Mickey Mouse cartoon, Walt actually had a couple of Mickey short cartoons before Steamboat Willie, uh, but he didn't release them because of the advent of sound. And he knew that it would be better with sound. More importantly, he knew the audience would love Mickey more with sound. And so he held off. He developed Steamboat Willie. Um, he took a lot of risk and made a massive investment and then premiered Steamboat Willie in November of 1928. And, and he just exploded in popularity and exploded in popularity 
uh, right on the cusp of the Great Depression. And when you think about Mickey Mouse, he has this indomitable spirit, which was the exact spirit that America needed and the world needed to get us through those 12 years of darkness and depression. Wow. And I like how you mentioned that because when we think about the time and, and because we all, everybody said, well, we can all, not everybody, but people say, oh, I would have done a difference. But you have to go back and look at the time of the era that he was actually doing this, where he actually, Walt actually came up and said, I want to do a theme park. And, and that developed when he was a young child. Uh, when all mm -hmm. this was growing up and he actually went out and he, there was a park that I, I can't think of the name of it now in the book, but it talks about, it burned down. It was an well, electric was park, electric park. And it was a huge park. And, and a lot of people actually went out there to promote that park. And, and, and it was a beautiful because all the lights and everything, it gave Walt that idea. Those lights are eliminating, uh, illuminating people like that. Uh, but it all started way, way back in well, many, many years ago in order to, to build that, that vision, what he was talking about. Yeah, and I think for a lot of us, if you want to know where your interests lie, where you're naturally curious, what you're passionate about, it, it goes back to what your natural interests were when you were a child. Um, you know, for me, my mother had gone to Disneyland when she was living in Reno, Nevada. Um, sometime around 1960, she shared those stories with me. Um, she had a, a puzzle from the park that she had bought as a souvenir. And so I can remember as a kid sitting up my train set around that puzzle of Disneyland and playing with it over and over and over again for hours on end, having no idea that I would end up going to the park, you know, eight, 900 times, writing books about it, traveling the country and the world, um, speaking and teaching on it. I'm just a little boy playing with my train set and a puzzle that my mom had bought way back in 1960. And yet there are those touch points, just like there were in Walt's life, whether it was uh, viewing Electric Park through a fence when he was a kid, or even the stories that his dad told. His dad had worked as a dollar a day laborer mm -hmm. at the 1893 World's Fair, which had a Midway amusement park section and he used that money uh, to fund building a home in Chicago, the very house that Walt Disney was actually born in, in 1901. So again, um, you can look back, Steve Jobs talks about this, you can look back and connect the dots and, and see that things sort of make sense after the fact. Wow, I think that's an amazing point that you actually elaborate, elaborated on that. That's really awesome. Um, I, I also read that, uh, uh, that when the park opened, um, and I want to say it was in uh, 1955, I think it was. In, in Correct. And when, yeah. it, when it opened, there was it was overcrowded. Uh, they had the, the plumbers were on strike. There was construction still going on, and the people went there and they said it wasn't a joyous occasion, uh, but it was more of a learning experience where everybody. Now, if you go to Disney, I mean, everything is like organized. Everything you, it, I mean, is is very well orchestrated. It's been that way for years. But when it first started off, just like when us, when we start start our business, it can be chaos. Chaos. It could be. Oh. It could be. Uh, you can you can look at this and say, oh man, why am I doing this? And and not, not, not even a fact about the other people that are naysayers saying you'll never think, think of all the people that told Walt Disney that he would fail. It'll never go anywhere. It'll never grow. It won't happen. So if you can yeah. maybe touch a little bit about that, saying despite the setbacks that you may experience, despite all the naysayers that may come your way, you have to keep your vision there. You'd spend a lot of time in your book speaking about that vision. Yeah. And, you know, when I get asked to talk about leadership, I believe vision is the most important, most crucial and critical piece because it's the vision. Here's where we are, but here's where we're going that separates leadership from management. And Walt had a vision for creating a park that told stories. And we had amusement parks in the 1950s, but they were parks that only engaged us physically. Walt wanted to do something that um, engaged us mentally and sparked our imaginations. And nobody believed in it. Um, his own wife and his own brother doubted him. When Walt was building Disneyland, it's been said he did not have a friend in the world. And it opened, just like you said, on July 17th, 1955. 
and was an abject disaster. In fact, it's known today in Disney history as quote unquote Black Sunday. Everything that could go wrong did go wrong. Um, it was a day supposed to be only for uh, the press, the media, celebrities, and VIPs. Approximately 9,000 tickets had been issued, 9,000 tickets that were easily counterfeited in 1955. So approximately 28 to 33,000 guests crashed the gates. A massive heat wave in uh, Anaheim uh, that day. So temperatures soared about 105 degrees. As you indicated, there had been a plumber strike. So at the last minute, uh, they managed to resolve the strike, but with only enough time to either finish the water fountains or the bathrooms. And Walt rationalized, well, I can sell them Coke. I can sell them Pepsi. I don't want the guests peeing in the streets. Finish the bathrooms. And then the press skewered him for forcing everyone to buy Coke or Pepsi versus having water fountains available. Uh, there was a gas leak in Fantasyland. The Mark Twain nearly capsized. Every attraction except for the Jungle Cruise would break down at least once, many of them multiple times throughout the day. Um, they had just poured the asphalt on Main Street USA that morning, did not have time to dry, especially in the 105 degree heat. And so women showing up at the park in the afternoon who had just come from church wearing their Sunday best, stepped onto Main Street, the street grabbed their high heel shoes and they ended up stepping right out of their shoes. And the only place they could buy shoes in the park back in 1955 was in Frontierland, a shop that sold Indian moccasins. So it was, again, um, not what we think of a Disney park today. But the real key was Walt's vision and specifically Walt taking responsibility. Uh, he didn't blame the weather. He didn't blame the bad press. Uh, he didn't blame uh, his cast members or his Imagineers. Um, he ignored what he couldn't fix, i.e. the weather, and focused on what he could. And by Labor Day, they had most everything turned around and were welcoming their one millionth guest. So you're, you're going to fail, whether it's Walt's bankruptcy when he was 21 in 1923, losing Oswald, or even having a really, really bad opening day. Uh, the question isn't, are you going to fail? The question is, how will you respond when you fail? And the word responsibility is simply the understanding of having the ability to what? Respond well. And Walt responded well each and every time. And that's the core lesson. I, I love that lesson because it's not what happens to you. It's how you respond to what happens to you. And I'll, I'll touch base on with Oswald one, one more time here, because if I remember right, it said that he took a long train ride to New York City. And uh, then I know it was a, a long, it gave him a lot of time to think he got there, he was rejected and he had to come back. So some people were in their mind would say, I'm just going to give up. I'm just going to quit this. In his mind, he's thinking about how he can actually pivot, how he can actually go back and go a different direction with it. That's amazing. Yeah. And, and the other key point is, uh, you know, he had been bankrupt five years earlier with his first studio in Kansas City. Rather than giving up, he boards a train for California, boards that train with $40, a single suitcase, and a one-way ticket, founds a second studio with his older brother, Roy, uh, which today is the largest entertainment company anywhere in the world. And he finally comes up with his first successful character, which is Oswald the Lucky Rabbit. And he signs a distribution deal with Universal and a fellow by the name of Charles Mintz not really thinking it all the way through, i.e. he's going to sign away the rights to the character as well. And now in 1928, he's hoping for a bigger and better contract because he's barely making any money off of Oswald despite the character's success. And when he goes to New York to negotiate, that's when he learns um, he doesn't have the rights to the character. They aren't going to give him a bigger and better contract. In fact, They've been busy in Southern California hiring away the very animators at Walt Studio who helped make Oswald so successful. And so Walt is steering bankruptcy in the face all over again. But on that train ride home, he remembers a character 
who had kept him company during those darkest days in Kansas City in the midst of going bankrupt. And it was a little mouse. And the memories of that mouse in Kansas City gave birth to what we know today as the world's most popular and, yes, profitable cartoon character, Mickey Mouse. That's, I, I, I love hearing that. And reading about it was really enlightening because I learned a little bit more details. But you hear about it, you've heard about it, but the reading, the, so thanks for writing that, writing that information down. That's an amazing story. Um, I think one of the other really great aspects, there's so many different attributes that Walt gave us and provided us with. And one was that he actually always had the, the philosophy to tell a story. And he always go back and say, you, you should have a narrative. You should actually, when, you, when you're doing something, when you're presenting something, even when you present yourself or your business, tell a story. Jeff, can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah. Um, so I've already mentioned um, in, in the midst of all of Walt's successes, he most wanted to be remembered as a storyteller. Mm -hmm. And that was his main purpose for building Disneyland. He didn't want an amusement park. He wanted a theme park, a theme park that told stories. Disneyland doesn't have rides. It has attractions. It gives guests story type experiences. And whether you realize it or not, um, your life is a story. Uh, you have to position yourself and see yourself as the hero in your own great story. And you have to recognize that the people around you are the characters in the story that you're living out. And you get to um, plot and plan the course of, you know, the arc of your story. You get to edit uh, when necessary. And you also need to recognize that every great story requires conflict. If there's no conflict, it's it's boring. It, it's middle-aged men living in the suburbs driving Volvos. Nobody's going to care, right? And so when, when you're up against it, when you're dealing with some sort of difficulty and some sort of adversity, rather than running away from it, embrace it, encourage it recognize that this is an opportunity to level up and begin living a better, if not greater story. And I always tell my audiences in my keynotes, the bigger your dragon, because, you know, in stories, we think about heroes sharpening their swords, going off on the path and between where they are and where they want to be, they're going to have to slay a few dragons along the way, right? Well, recognize the bigger your dragon, Maurice, the better your story. And Walt was a phenomenal storyteller, not because he focused on kids and not because he told happily ever after stories. Walt was a phenomenal storyteller because he recognized the importance of conflict and knowing that life is filled with dark shadows and we need both in order to have story and we need both in order to have a meaningful and purposeful life. Mm -hmm. And you and you can tell by the story that you what you're what you're mentioning right here that Walt was a person who always believed in detailing your destiny. And it's, it seems like he actually had a roadmap. He knew what he wanted to accomplish. He knew many, many years prior to that. He said, this is what I want. Like you said, the theme park. I want, I don't want an amusement park. I want a theme park. You know, and you talk about that in the book where we can actually take a lessons from leadership, actually how we have to detail our destiny. We should actually have that information written down. And you talk about, here's your stamp. You should always go, here's your, your point, of, your point of knowledge, your point of reference, detail your destiny, you know? Yeah. And I mean, one of my favorite stories comes from the very first attraction ever finished for any Disney park anywhere in the world, which was the old Disneyland Frontierland stagecoach. And um, they they built it at the studio in Burbank and then shipped it down to Anaheim, some 33 miles south. And as they were getting ready to wrap that attraction up, John Hinch, who uh, was Walt's favorite Imagineer and was probably... Um, the, the person at the studio most like Walt Disney, um, no matter what John did, he couldn't get the leather strap on the stagecoach to Walt Disney's liking. And out of frustration, he threw that leather strap across the room and said, darn it, Walt, it's just a leather strap. No one's going to notice. No one's going to care. And Walt looked at John and said, John, you're underestimating people. The guests are going to notice. They are going to care. In fact, 
every time a guest comes to Disneyland, they're going to see something, they're going to notice something that they've never seen or noticed before. And that's what's going to keep them coming back to Disneyland over and over and over again. So yeah, Walt had this grand vision. He was a phenomenal storyteller. He also recognized the importance of the details and filling the story, filling the park in with those critical details uh, so that everything worked to tell a united story. That's amazing. Details. I like that word. And I and I you you uh, rekindle my mind to think about even with the with the people and the staff and as far as setting expectations. And it mentioned inside you mentioned inside the book there about you have your name and then you have where you're from. And actually, everybody's actually on the same clear expectations. Everyone's still going in the same direction and how critical that is, especially as a leader of an organization, how Walt was able to take that and make sure everybody was on the same same sheet of music, singing off the same sheet of music, per se. Yeah, and I, I get asked frequently, you know, oh, how does Disney do it? Um, you know, they have such a standard of customer service and they, um, you know, are the most amazing anything, whether it's hospitality or theme parks or, you know, whatever. And, you know, the answer is ra relatively simple. It's not necessarily easy, but it's relatively simple. And it's not um, anything to do with micromanagement. No, nobody wants to be micromanaged. And, you know, Walt Disney, quite frankly, was anything but a micromanager. So, uh, when he hired a fellow by the name of Van Arsdell France, who had come out of the aer aeronautical slash aerospace industry in Texas uh, to lead up the cast member training program, he simply told him, I want to build a team, a family that's empowered to create happiness. That was it. That, that, that was the only edict. That was the only order. That was the only mandate. And if you think about it, if you're going to be building the quote unquote happiest place on earth, well, then it makes sense that you're going to fill it. You're going to cast it with what? Happy people. Well, <laughs> think of how many times we like go to the doctor and we're dealing with medical professionals that don't seem to like patients. Or I was in, you know, higher education for more than two decades and, you know, professor after professor after professor couldn't have cared less about students or, you know, your local church and you meet the pastor and the pastor turns out not to be a people person, right? Uh, you know, and so Walt understood the importance, not just of not micromanaging, uh, but hiring well, training well, letting people go. And hiring well starts with making sure that the individual is a cultural fit. Um, and, and it's not about how they do it. It's not about what they do. It's about making sure they fit in terms of why you're doing what you do. Wow. Very, very key statement there. That's spot on. So Jeff, let me ask you another question here. And you have years, this is more of your, of your understanding because you, you, you know, leadership, you, you understand, you've seen it, you've seen that the Disney, uh, Walt Disney, his philosophy, his, his, his methods and, and how it's actually instilled in the organization even today and how valuable that is. When you think about leadership and leadership is actually uh, kind of it made some kind of evolutions over time. And, and I was mentioning to you earlier, I talked about the social aspect of the, the trust factor uh, how do you actually see leadership today when you think about the way Walt actually set everything up and then and actually making um, any kind of changes in the in the future? What do you where do you see leadership is going to actually go? How do you think that's going to migrate over to, over over time in the next few years? Well, I think we have to recognize um, that leadership, like every other whatever in the universe, is going to change and going to evolve. Uh, the only constant in the universe is what change. And so we as leaders um, have to know that we have to um, uh, prepare for that. And we have to prepare our team and our organization for that. Um, you know, Walt, uh, you know, recognized um, and, and was always ready to adapt. So for example, you know, he starts off uh, as an ambulance driver at the end of World War One. Uh, then he wants to uh, become an actor and pivots to becoming an animator. 
um, from doing short cartoons. He gets into full length animated feature films, ultimately the amusement park industry. And then at the end of his life, he's working on Walt Disney World in Central Florida. But Walt Disney World was never about Magic Kingdom or what I refer to as Disneyland 2.0. It was all about Walt's original vision for Epcot which was his experimental prototype community of tomorrow, an actual domed city that was going to be the city of tomorrow, the city of the 21st century, what was getting into urban planning. And so Walt recognized as a leader, things are always going to be changing. And he himself set the example of what? Being willing to change, being willing to adapt, being willing to pivot. And then from there, um, he also knew that, you know, he had to set not just a strategic example, but a tactical example as well. Uh, you know, the Disney parks are known for their cleanliness. There's a trash can every 30 feet. Well, two points to that. First of all, the way they came up with 30 feet is Walt's favorite food was a hot dog. And he just grabbed one one day and started walking and figured out how many feet does it take me to eat the hot dog before I'm ready to toss the wrapper? And the answer was 30 feet. And that's when he told you know, his team, we need trash cans in the park every 30 feet because that's how long it took Walt to be done with his hot dog and ready to toss the wrapper. But then secondly, um, when it came time to pick up the trash, that wasn't a job just for the custodians. That was everybody's job to include Walt Disney's job. Nothing was beneath him, despite the fact that he was the CEO, despite the fact that he owned the park, despite the fact that he was Mr. Disney. At the end of the day, he was Walt, just like you're Maurice and I'm Jeff, and the park had to stay clean. That was a core value, and he was committed to making it happen as much as he was committed to hiring cast members who were tasked with making it happen and then um you know also recognizing the importance of technology mm -hmm. uh, you know technology can be defined by anything invented or created after you were born so you know what a 20 year old college student today thinks is technology um is different than what I thought was technology when I went to college in 1982. A VCR was amazing technology to me 40 years ago. That's not what a college kid would think was the latest, greatest technology. Um, a lot of companies, a lot of leaders fear technology. Um, they get frustrated with technology because it's always changing. It always seems to be uh, intruding. Um, Walt embraced it, whether it was introducing sound with Mickey Mouse, whether it was lengthening out the animated uh, cartoons into a full length feature film or using television to help fund his dream for Disneyland. The Hollywood studios in the mid 1950s hated television. It was going to destroy their industry. It was going to destroy their business. Um, Walt embraced the technology, recognizing that it was the perfect medium to get into the American home and speak directly to the American family right in their living rooms. And so he created a partnership with ABC and that partnership helped fund the park and promote Disneyland months before it ever opened. And so I think we have to first of all recognize leadership is going to change. We have to change. It's going to evolve. We have to evolve. And again, hire well. And if if you hire um, well and train well and let people go to include younger people who are way more up to speed with all of this than I am and probably you are, um, if you tr hire well, train well, and let them go, they are going to create magic well above your expectations and anything you thought was possible. Right. And you talk about that inside the book. So the book is very, very excellent because it gives examples of that, too. Yeah. And and Walt was not that good of an animator. And the only attraction single handedly designed by Walt himself is Tom Sawyer Island. Um, Walt's gift, other than being a storyteller, uh, was putting together a phenomenal team, providing them with the vision and then letting them go.
Wow. And it goes back with what you're talking about, the four C's with that curiosity, the confidence, the courage, and the uh, consistency, you know, those kind of leadership attributes. It really goes when you actually empower your team to go to another level, you know? Excellent. Yeah, and, and Walt had a way of bringing out talents and abilities and gifts in his team that those team members themselves didn't even know that they had. And I, I've had the privilege of interviewing uh, Imagineers and legends who worked with Walt, were hired by Walt, and they still revere him some 56 years after his death. And if I ask them, hey, what was it like for you the day that Walt Disney died? They won't even speak about it. It, it still breaks them up more than five decades later. That's how powerful a force he was in their life. And that's how much um, his leadership meant to them. Wow, that's amazing. So thank you for this information. I just want to say one other thing here, and I know you can elaborate on this. I, I, I read that there were some some 300 hidden symbols in the parks, like different, you could see if you could find the mouse here. And, uh, and I, I thought that was pretty fun to read that. I said, I never thought about that. I didn't know. I heard of that, that there are different hit, hidden uh, symbols that you have to find it. I didn't know that there were three. Is, is that at every park or is that just one specific park where you have to have, there's so many hidden symbols? With, so with um, I, I think what you're referring to are the hidden Mickeys. Mickey and Mouse, the hidden yes. Mickeys um, ha have an amazing backstory. So um, let, let me fill you in on the backstory and then we can talk about the numbers. So um, you know, Walt opens Disneyland July 1955. Um, and despite the challenges of opening day, it's almost an instant and overnight success to the point where cities around the country, countries around the world are calling Walt, begging for him to build them their own Disneyland. And each and every time his response was exactly the same. No, there will never be another Disneyland. Uh, Walt hated sequels. He never wanted to repeat himself. He wanted to move on to the next newest, latest, greatest thing. And so, again, doing a Disneyland sequel didn't make any sense to him. However, by the late 1950s, early 1960s, he was starting to get interested in urban planning and realized that um, despite the success of Disneyland, only about 5 to 8 percent of guests on any given day came from east of the Mississippi River. And at the time, that's where 75% of the U.S. population lived. And so he was missing out on a huge market back east. So he started thinking about doing a quote-unquote East Coast Disneyland because he knew there was a market for one, but also it was a chance for him, if he bought enough land, to get into urban planning. So he ends up buying 27,440 acres in Central Florida, land 150 times the size of Disneyland. They're going to build Magic Kingdom or Disneyland 2.0, mainly to fund what Walt really wants to do, which is Epcot. And then Walt dies in December of 1966, six months before they ever broke ground in Florida. His brother Roy comes out of retirement, gets Walt Disney World open at least phase one, which was always going to be Magic Kingdom. And then Roy dies two months later. And then the company doesn't have a Disney to lead it and no clue about what to do with Epcot. Finally, around 1979, they green light Epcot, but they don't green light it as a city. They green light it as another theme park. It's an amazing theme park, but it's another Disney type theme park. It's also their first non-castle park. It was going to be more adult oriented and for the first time it was going to be a Disney park that sold alcohol and the, the executives panicked saying, hey, we're not sure about this whole Epcot thing. It's a little more adult oriented. It doesn't have a castle. We're selling alcohol. So to protect the brand, they said that Mickey and all of his friends, all of his pals weren't going to be allowed or seen or appear in Epcot. And the, the Imagineers who were designing and building the park were quite upset 
uh, because they knew that the mouse was the core of the company. And they remembered what Walt Disney had said, let's never forget, it all started with a mouse. So they sort of revolted and rebelled, and everywhere they could, they put it in three simple circles. Because at the end of the day, that's what Mickey is, is three simple circles. Mm -hmm. And over time, guests started recognizing these so-called hidden Mickeys, and they became so popular that now, um, like you indicated, they're included intentionally. But originally, they started in Epcot based on the whole idea that at first, Mickey Mouse wasn't going to be allowed to appear in a Disney park. Wow, that's an amazing story. <laughs> so, so. Yeah. <laughs> Very yeah. good. And, and so how many are there? Um, oh, I mean, it, it probably changed. Like, th they'll rip up carpet in a hotel and put down new carpet, and the carpet will have who knows how many dozens or hundreds of, mm -hmm. you know, circles in it so um it, it's it's impossible to know they're, they're, so in other words there's quite a few you just have to look for them and have fun yeah. doing it. <laughs> and and it, it and and there are books out there on the hidden mickeys and it, it can be fun for you friends family um to play the hidden mickey game when you are at the parks but again it all started in epcot and oh by the way um, when Eisner and Wells came in to run the company in 1984 and they found out Mickey wasn't allowed at Epcot, they were absolutely baffled. And one of the first decisions they made was, yeah, um, that doesn't make any sense. Um, put put Mickey and the gang in Epcot. And so if you go there today, you'll not just see the hidden Mickeys, but you'll see Mickey himself. And that goes back to uh, Michael Eisner and Frank Wells and them starting to run the company and turn the company around in 1984. Wow, it's amazing. Look at the numbers today. You know, they're, they're doing pretty good, you know. It's, it's a fun yeah. place. It's an experience. <laughs> it, it, it is. It is. Wow. So, Jeff, I really want to thank you. Guys, I, and I normally don't do this, but I have to go back and say, this is one of the best business books I've actually, I'm trying to put the book up to the screen. It's like, let me do it. Uh, but I, I want to, it's, it's the, the wisdom of Walt and lessons, leadership lessons from the happiest place on earth by Jeffrey A. Barnes, who we just heard uh, give us an insight to it. So there's a lot of information here, a lot of great leadership information that uh, those of us who've been in leadership or who, who aspire to go into leadership, you can really learn a lot. Most people go pick up the regular business books you really need to pick up this book. Jeff has done a fantastic job. And there's two of them because you have, you have another one that you read. I haven't read that one yet, but I, my wife is already yeah. picking up for the holidays for me. So that's next. Yeah, the follow-up book uh, was a result of the first book, Doing So Well, and it's titled Beyond the Wisdom of Walt and is based on stories and lessons out of Walt Disney World and picks up um, with Walt's death and how um, his team followed his vision through despite his untimely death again in December of 1966. See, I'll have that one done by, by December 31st of 2022. <laughs> I'm looking forward to it. Uh, thank there you. Jeff. Go. I really appreciate you taking the time to uh, spend with me to uh, talk about leadership, uh, to give uh, everybody and give the world more insight in, into uh, the, the wisdom of Walt. I really want to thank you for your time. All right. Well, thank you, Maurice. Um, Merry Christmas. Happy holidays. Um, have a great end to 2022, a fantastic 2023. And uh, if any of your listeners want to look me up, they can find me at the wisdom of Walt, uh, dot com and would love to continue this conversation. Excellent. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Maurice. Bye bye. Thanks for listening. If you've enjoyed this episode and you'd like to help support the podcast, please share it with others, post about it on social media, or leave a rating and review. To catch all the latest from your host, connect with Maurice on LinkedIn at Maurice Hamilton. Thanks again, and we'll see you next time.